This is video uh, number nine from Digital Dash University. We're considering different topics in quantum mechanics. In the previous video, we had talked a little bit about unitary operators, and we said that in the next video, we are going to start to discuss uh, position operators. Actually, before we go into that, we want to take a brief detour and try to discuss some of the general terms that are used in quantum mechanics. There are abstract definitions, and a lot of times when you encounter them for the first time, they don't really make sense. So we're going to try and go over some of the, the ideas behind some of the general terminology, sort of set the stage for what's going to be happening in the uh, next series of videos. And when you're reading about quantum mechanics, uh, quite often they'll refer to the physical state of a system. And they'll say the physical state is represented by different complex functions, and the functions are in Hilbert space. And um, Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, and it's also an inner product space. Now, we're not even going to try and get into the, the mathematics of infinite dimensional um, uh, function spaces. But in the last video, we did discuss taking the inner product of uh, two functions. If we had, say, function A and function B, we can assume these have complex parts to them. And then what that amounts to is taking the integral of complex conjugate of A times B. And let's just see, we're just going to integrate this with respect to X. In fact, for all of our videos from here on out, we're just going to be concerned with one dimensional systems, uh, quantum mechanical particles moving along on the X axis. So this would be integrated with respect to DX over some limits. And that's the inner product of two functions. Now, when they say the physical state of the system, exactly what are they referring to? And let's forget about quantum mechanics for a moment. And let's just consider classical mechanics. Suppose that we have a spring. with an object attached to it, and we pull the spring out, displace it, let it go, and let this oscillate back and forth. So let's say we stretch it out to here, let it go, now it's moving back and forth, and let's say when it's in this position, moving back towards here, let's just say we freeze it at this moment in time. So what information could we have about the system? Well, we could ask, what is the x-coordinate at that particular moment in time? Or what is the position of the object? The velocity of it. What is the velocity of it at that time? And of course, if we know the velocity, then we know the direction it's moving in. Um, what is the potential energy it would have at that moment in time? What is the momentum? So you see, all of these variables here together would comprise the state of the system at that particular moment in time, or what forces are acting on the particle. Now, imagine that we have a particle, a quantum mechanical particle, just moving along somewhere on the x-axis. Now here, when they're talking about the physical state of the system, um, as we just said, usually that's represented by a whole series of uh, complex functions. And what they'll do is they'll kind of like aggregate them all together into a single vector called a state vector. So let's say we had a state vector beta. And 
when Dirac was first formalizing all of this, what he was trying to do was to get away from having to refer to all of these components here in any particular basis representation. So he was just sort of trying to think of an abstract notation that would represent them all together. For example, we could say, well, there are vectors, finite vectors, that exist in three-dimensional space, and they all have some information to them. They all have a certain magnitude, and they all have a certain direction. Now, say one of those vectors, v, that has a certain magnitude and a certain direction, if we wanted to, we could expand it in terms of our basis vectors. For example, these three vectors here are linearly independent, but so are these. So our vector in three-dimensional space, we could represent it in terms of these basis vectors, each multiplied by its proper coefficient, or we could represent it in terms of these basis vectors. And of course, if we do that, these are going to be a different set of coefficients. Well, when Dirac was formalizing all of this, he just wanted to sort of refer to all of these complex functions and whatever comprises the state of the, of the system in some abstract sort of way. So when he was manipulating this stuff, he didn't have to be trapped, if you will, in terms of thinking of it in any particular um, basis type system or any type basis of basis functions. Because if you have different basis functions, then you have different representations. Well, what we can do is we can think of, for example, we know that in quantum mechanics they quite often refer to the wave function of the particle. So if we have, say, psi of x, the wave function here, and again we're just saying psi of x is we're just considering one-dimensional systems, not just for this video, but for the whole rest of the videos, or at least the next 10 or 15 videos. So here we have a wave function called psi of x. That has the property that when you multiply this by its complex conjugate, that tells us the probability of finding our particle at a particular point on the x-axis. I'm just going to say psi complex time psi. Or we could have a momentum wave function. And this has the characteristic that when you multiply this by its complex conjugate, that tells us the probability that our particle moving along the axis here is going to have a certain probability. So it would be this. Well, then we can think of as our state vector here being comprised of a lot of things. One of them being the wave function of our particle. So let's just say here is our state vector beta that has all this information from all these different functions that comprise it. And we're saying, OK, one of the many functions that comprise it is the wave function here, so that when you multiply this by its complex conjugate, it tells us the probability of locating the particle at a certain position. Well, how do we pull this out of the state vector? And the way you do that is you have a function of position, and you take the inner product of that with the state vector b. And that gives us the wave function, which will ultimately determine the probability that the particle is going to be at a given position. So this is some function that determines the position of the particle. We take the inner product of that with the state vector, and that gives us the wave function here. And this, in turn, when you multiply it by its complex conjugate, gives us the probability of locating the particle 
at a certain point here on the line. And again, this might seem very general, very abstract, and it is. In the future videos, we'll continue working with these concepts, and as we use them over and over, hopefully they'll make more sense to you. Now, we could also think of it as our state vector, which is just represented as a, as a cat vector here, again, being comprised of many different functions, one of them being the momentum wave function. So how do we, just roughly speaking, how do we pull out the momentum wave function, I'll call it, from our general state vector? And the way you do that is you have some function that determines momentum, and you take the inner product of that with our state cat vector beta, and then that gives us the momentum wave function. And again, this has the property that when you multiply it by its complex conjugate, that tells us the probability that the particle is going to have a certain momentum value. So we're going to use these uh, concepts a lot in the uh, upcoming videos, and we have more examples of them. Hopefully they'll start to make more sense to you. But since they are rather strange, um, and they are rather abstract, we just sort of want to introduce the concepts in this video, and we wanted to try to use some classical analogs, like from classical mechanics and just three-dimensional analogs here to sort of convey uh, what these abstract ideas are all about. So hopefully it was some help to you. Hopefully it made some sense. If you're still scratching your head, wondering what all this gibberish is about, please don't give up with us. Come back, join us for the next video. We're going to discuss the um, position operator, and we'll use these concepts more and more, and hopefully they'll start to make more sense to you.